If you're a med student, head to mosaic.org for free medical study notes and resources from other med students from around the world. So we're talking about the eighth point five. Now the ethmoid bone <clears throat> is located in the roof of the nasal cavity. And in fact, it's also located in the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. So the bone is acting as a partition between the nasal cavity and the intracranial contents. It's basically got three functions and I dare say that's the most important. The second one's pretty important too in that it forms the medial or part of the medial wall of the orbit. And the third one is that it contributes it's the superior aspect of the nasal septum. So it's an unpaired bone in the roof of the nasal cavity that separates the nasal cavity and the brain, separates the nasal cavity and the eye, and forms part of the nasal septum. So what does it look like? If you're looking at it from the front, You basically draw a sword or a cross like this, and that is then connected to what are called the two lateral masses, one on either side, or labyrinths. I'm just going to kind of draw them like this. They're basically rectangles. I'll explain a bit in a sec, but that's essentially an overview of what it looks like. So, this section here, this part in here, this is the nasal cavity, and this part above it, this is the anterior cranial fossa, and this will be the brain sitting up here. So, what's, what's actually separating them, the, the specific piece of bone, is this part here. And if you were to look down on it. So we're now we're now in the anterior cranial fossa. And this projection here is this here. What you see is all of these tiny little holes, foramina. And from above down, this section looks like a sieve. And because the Latin for sieve is cribrum, that's how this gets its name as the crib reform or sieve like plate. And they're very important, those little foramina because fibers from the olfactory nerve, you know, the nerve for smell, are passing through them into the nose. That's how they get there, through the little holes, or the foramina, in the cribriform, the sieve-like plate. So it's forming the boundary between the nose and the brain, but there are fibers from the olfactory nerve that are passing through it, which is how we're able to smell. Now, this thing here is also this thing here, and it is in the anterior cranial fossa. And when you look at it from the side, so from a lateral view, so what I'll do, I'll draw this thing here first, and it looks like. Kind of looks like that, and then when I add the others on, 
looks like this. And this section here, this section here, that's it. So this here again, this is the brain. Or the inside of, of the the intracranial space. And then this here is the is the nasal space. And the reason I've been kind of going on about this is because when you look at this in a lateral view, it kind of looks like a rooster's comb. And that's funny because Christagali, it's two L's, which is the name that's given to this piece of bone, that just happens to be in Latin, Christagali is comb of the rooster. So that's how it's got its name, the Christagali. So you've got the cribriform plate going across, and you've got the Christagali sitting on top of it. And the Christagali in the anterior cranial fossa, it is the attachment for the fault cerebri. Alright, so now we can address this thing down here. Now this looks like another plate of bone and it's perpendicular, 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 ah, to the cribriform plate. So a plate that is perpendicular, perpendicular to the cribriform plate is called the perpendicular plate. We got there in the end. The perpendicular plate. Right, so the perpendicular plate is forming the superior aspect of the nasal septum. And what actually happens is the nasal septum is otherwise composed of a little bone called the voma. And the voma is rising up and it basically runs, has kind of the same dimensions widthwise as the perpendicular plate. And it just rises up to meet it and the perpendicular plate kind of comes down to meet it. So then we've got these lateral or labyrinthine masses. Now, they are basically composed of how can I make this neat? They are composed of air cells. Pneumatized cells, air cells. And so they're very, very light. The, the, the bits of bone are basically paper thin, it's very, very thin. And the air cells are a little bit more lateral than two other structures. So they are the superior turbinate and the middle turbinate. Superior turbinate, middle turbinate. So those turbinates, the trick is the superior and the middle turbinate, they both come from the ethmoid bone. But the inferior turbinate, this is the trick, inferior turbinate comes from a separate bone. Just called the inferior turbinate. Whereas these are the superior and middle turbinates, and they are both part of the ethmoid bone. So to kind of get an appreciation of these turbinates in the other views, well, you can't see it looking down on it because you can't see through the cribriform plate. But looking laterally, this guy here, that is the superior turbinate. See how it's, see how it's uh, running more inferiorly as it moves posteriorly. And it's kind of the same for the middle terminate, which is this one here. They're both kind of going like this. And that's that one there. So there's something else here, though, you might notice. The unsonant process. Now, the unsonant process, which would be like this, the 
the uncinate process is very important in the uh, lateral nasal wall. And the reason is that the the hiatus semilunaris, which is part of the drainage pathway for the sinuses, is bordered anteriorly and inferiorly by the uncinate process. So here we're looking at, at the uncinate process from a lateral view, but if you look at it from a medial view, the uncinate process is an important landmark for the hiatus semilunaris, which is very important in the drainage pathway of the sinuses. We'll talk about that in a later tube, but that is basically the importance of the uncinate process. It's a very good landmark, uh, and it's it's a very important landmark in the osteomiatal complex um, and in the opening for the maxillary sinus. So, you might think, what's this kind of huge chunk of bone that we haven't talked about yet? Well, that is the most lateral of structures in this lateral view. And that is the lamina, and I always spell this wrong, papyracea. I hope that's spelled right. I'll correct it if it's not. But the lamina pap papyracea is super paper thin. It's very, very thin, and it's the lateral most structure here. It's paper thin. And it is it that forms the medial wall of the orbit. Or part of the medial wall, because it's not the only bone. There are other bones. So, now, and, and here, this anterior thing, just to fill things out, mm -hmm. just to try and make it kind of 3D, that's just pneumatized air cells. That's, that's just looking at this section here. So, basically, just to quickly recap... The ethmoid bone has three main functions. It forms the border between the roof of the nasal cavity and the floor of the cranium. It is also a border for the medial orbital wall and it provides some of the support superiorly for the nasal septum. When you look at the ethmoid bone, conceptually, it's got two lateral masses that are joined by what looks like a cross. And Arguably the most important part of the bone is this portion of the cross that joins the two masses. That is the cribriform plate because it looks like a sieve and it looks like a sieve because fibres from the olfactory nerve are passing down through it. The only it, it is lying on the floor of the anterior cranial fossa and what's extending up uh, into the anterior cranial fossa is this thing that looks like a rooster comb, the comb of the rooster in Latin, Christigali. The Christigalli is rising up and continuing directly inferior to be the part that supports the septum. It's perpendicular, perpendicular to the cribriform plate, so it is the perpendicular plate. Now when we address the lateral masses, the lateral masses are basically just air cells and on their medial aspect they've got the superior and a middle turbinates. And the trick is that there are three turbinates normally, the superior, middle, and inferior, but the inferior isn't part of the bone, okay? And then most laterally, you've got the lamina papricia, which is forming part of the medial border of the orbit, okay? That's the ethmoid bone. If you're a med student, check out mosaic.org. We've got a written tutorial for this, heaps of resources for med students.